Welcome to another episode of season 2 of Travel Stories with Mosh, the first travel podcast in the Middle East. If you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then you are in the right place because here every week I'll be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us on a fascinating journey around the world by sharing their travel stories. So let's talk about ethical travel today, something which is very crucial in the world that we live in now. Today's very special guest is someone who is very passionate about wildlife. Chloe Evans doesn't just love animals, but she also dedicates a lot of her time in protecting them and preserving their natural habitat. So much so that she's even set up a company called Wild Tracks here in Dubai, which focuses on taking people on conservation missions to protect wildlife that is endangered in South Africa. Chloe, first of all, respect to what you do, and thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, of course, we have a lot to talk about, um, including, I guess, many trips to South Africa. But tell me, what really is Wild Tracks? Because I'm very intrigued to know what you do in terms of conservation and protection of endangered species. Wild Tracks is all about hands-on conservation missions. So we basically take people from around the world, mm-hmm. particularly the UAE, to South Africa and hopefully expanding to some other countries as well, uh, to basically work with a veterinarian and with mm-hmm. the local communities to support endangered wildlife. So we do many different initiatives. Um, some of them is things like rhino dehorning. We also do predator collaring, and we also do relocations of animals as well to maintain a good biodiversity within the areas. Um, and it's also about raising awareness for these subjects. Um, often you see a lot of times in the media about different causes, and mm-hmm. I think bringing people to the actual environment that they're in um, and seeing with their own eyes the impact that they could be having. Yeah. Um, that's what Wild Tracks was was made for, basically. Yeah. But you know, you spoke about uh, rhino dehorning, and rhinos are very, very much at risk now. Yeah. Uh, there are just very few left in the world today. Why did you think like dehorning them uh, was something that could actually save their lives? Yeah, so it's not the only solution that's available. Um, poaching is basically when a rhino is killed for its horn. Mm-hmm. Um, and it happens to a lot of animals as well. Elephants, another one for their tusks. And basically their horn is perceived to have medicinal values in traditional medicine. Um, It doesn't, it's just keratin, the same as our fingernails and our hair. Such a misconception. Yeah, Yeah. and also the status symbol, because it's an illegal trade. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. unfortunately, this is something that is being targeted with rhinos at the moment. Um, So, what we're, we're doing is is bringing people to try and brainstorm or come up with different solutions on how we can protect them. Mm-hmm. Dehorning isn't the only one, uh, but it is one of the activities that we found that is having a successful impact on preserving rhinos. Obviously, if there's no horn, there's no reward, there's yeah. no reason to kill the animal. And this is all in South Africa for now? Yeah, at the moment it's in South Africa. So I'm working mainly with three reserves and one wildlife veterinarian who's just incredible mm-hmm. and he really lets the gas um get hands on with the animals we're doing needlework dna sampling um you're involved in the whole operation from the helicopter going up the yeah darting. i was just going to ask you sounds like a lot i mean it is a great cause and yeah. also sounds like a really amazing experience so talk to us about how this whole thing happens yeah so it's it's not something that i want to um portray as a, a commercial activity mm-hmm. because um, for me, the the ethics behind it is, is part of why I started the company, and I'm very uh, aware of the fine line between commercializing of animals, which is something I don't agree with. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is a need to uh, collect funds in order to run these projects. So basically, and what to we save them actually. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So basically, what we do at the beginning of the year is we decide what animals need the most care and protection. So on most trips, there's normally three to four animals that we do. And when you say three to four animals, this is only rhinos? No, these are types of animals. So for example, um, in one trip coming up, we've got two lions that we need to collar. We've got a cheetah that we need to collar. We need to dehorn five rhinos. And then we also Mm. need to do an 
elephant collaring. So it's jam packed. Wow. And then on top of that, we also do the community days as well and right. then normal safari. Um, so when the, the groups come, the rhinos or animal that we're working on has normally been um, monitored for a few days. Then we have the, the helicopter with the pilot, we have the veterinarian, and then we have the support crew, which are normally the reserve managers. Mm -hmm. Um, basically, we go up in the helicopter, the pilot and the vet, they will locate the animal, they will then dart the animal. And it's just a medicine in the dart, which basically immobilizes them. So it either sends them to sleep or, or makes them more relaxed and chilled so we can work on them. And then we and come in. And get off the helicopter. Yeah, so it's mainly the vet and the pilot that goes in the helicopter. Um, I don't know if any guests would want to go in. They're flying like crazy to, to really get the animal into a safe position where they can be darted. Mm -hmm. That's the key part of why we use the, the, the chopper. Um, and then the vehicles come in, which is where the guests are on. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and then okay. we get out once the, the animal's been immobilized. Uh, and then the first action is normally to blindfold and put in earplugs, and this mm. is to reduce the stress. Mm. Uh, and then we start actively working. We want to keep them um, under the medication for as short time as possible to reduce the amount of stress or risk to the animal. Mm -hmm. So it's all done quite quickly, but by the time you're on your fifth dehorning, the whole group already know the procedure and it goes quite quickly. Mm. And then normally what happens is the vet will measure two to three centimeters above the base of the horn because at the bottom there's nerve endings. So we don't want to touch that. That is where it gets critical and that is why the poaching actually kills the animals. Yeah, right? exactly. Because normally they're hacking uh, away the horn because mm. they want to do it as quickly as possible and they don't have the right equipment and obviously they're on land that they shouldn't be and they're doing something illegal um so when they do this they normally hack off most of the face which mm. is why the animal either dies during the process or they're left with very mm. little survival rate so if you don't touch the nerve endings it's a pretty painless process and then the best part is when you wake them up and you see them reunited with their herd or with their calf um, and then within 12 to 18 months, it's normally grown back significantly um, in order for so it to be So it's a work horns. in progress. Yeah. I mean, of course, it's not irreversible, like you said. So the horn grows back yeah. and then you go back again to kind of uh, dehorn it again. Yeah. But that is the only way right now, which seems like a good way of protecting these animals, right? Dehorning is the one that seems to have the most impact at the moment. And as you said, it's reversible, mm. which is the best thing. So if a better technology or a better solution comes out, it means that the rhino still has its horn, which is mm. what we, we yeah. know it for. It's yeah. African unicorn, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's so fantastic what you do. And, um, you know, there's amazing trips that you do to Africa. Uh, of course, now we want to go on a journey with you and uh, want to know where you're taking us. I am hoping you're taking us to uh, an incredible place with some really amazing animals. Yes, definitely. So I think South Africa, as I've already mentioned, is mm -hmm. is the country that I'm I'm honing in on. But I've also recently just got back from Namibia, mm -hmm. which is also a, a hidden gem. It's so beautiful and it's got the same wildlife as we see in South Africa. So I'm hoping to expand um, wild tracks reach. But today it's all about South Africa. OK, let's talk about South Africa. Yeah. I love that country, though. It's so much <laughs> that they offer and it's so so beautiful yeah. but let's see it through your eyes today yeah there's so much diversity mm. i think um you know if you go to the cape um cape town there's table mountain there's mountain biking there's all the you know there's the beach with the penguins on um there's so much to do there. there's great wine yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> the vineyards as well yeah um you've got the ocean you've got the bush you've got the city, you've got mm. a bit of everything. But the reserves that I work with are um, based around the Durban and Johannesburg area. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say that normally I just go straight to the reserve. So I think the wildlife side is probably more we will talk about today. Mm -hmm. um, so normally when we go there, we have a normal itinerary, which will be for example, game drives, a safari. I think what everyone normally pictures when they think of South Africa. Right. So. So what really attracts you to, I mean, of course, there's all these other things. We know there are so many facets to South Africa. But for you specifically, when you're talking to us about South Africa and you're taking us on this journey, what really attracts you to go there so many times in a year? Um, is it the animals? Is it, is it the work that you do? I mean, of course, the work is separate. But otherwise, if you were not doing wild tracks, what is it that keeps calling you back to South Africa? The animals, yeah, for sure. I mean, seeing them in the wild, you know, seeing a lion make a kill, um, going out on a night drive, seeing the hippos coming out to graze, 
um, seeing the rhinos, you know, free and happy. Mm. That's what just keeps bringing me back. Mm. Um, also, I just think that the atmosphere there, it's very relaxed, very chilled. You know, in the evenings, we normally sit around the, the campfire. Um, there's not normally great signal. Uh, so we, we're forced to talk. Yeah, and which is a great, great thing. Yeah. yeah, over a bottle of wine yeah. and... Um, and honestly, we go into everything and anything uh, when mm. we have these conversations. And I just think to be grounded, to mm. be removed from, I mean, I love Dubai, I love living here, mm. um, but my life is busy and it's corporate mm. and it's um, luxury and what we need to do and what's the next best thing. Mm. Whereas to go back there, I feel like I go to me as a child. Yeah, it's humbling. You know? Yeah, exactly. Humbling mm. and grounding. So really South Africa has your heart. Yeah. But you know, growing up, um, I mean, clearly you've always loved animals. But as far as travel is concerned, growing up, was there any particular place that kind of made you realize that you love travel or any incident that happened that made you realize that you love this life of travel? I think when I was 17, 18, I went on a school trip to Peru mm. and we went for one month and there we were building um, orphanages, playgrounds, and we also did the Solcante trek to Machu Picchu. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was the, the time in my life where I thought, I don't mind how much of my money I spend on traveling because the experience and the, the cultures that I see and the people that I meet is worthwhile. And then yeah. from there, um, I studied in the UK, but I did a semester in Australia. And then I visited um, Southeast Asia, Japan, uh, New Zealand, and then I also interrailed through Europe. So I got the travel bug. And from Amazing. now, like any Eid holidays or yeah, public holidays off. we get, I'm off. Yeah. <laughs> and then you live in a place where it's so easy to take off as well. But yeah. would you say that meeting different kinds of people, exchanging, um, you know, cultural talk and all of that is kind of what attracted you to travel in the first place? Yeah, definitely. And just seeing uh, what the world has to offer. Mm -hmm. I love nature. I love seeing different environments mm. and I'm I would say that I prefer more of the countryside to yeah. cities yeah um but I, I visit pretty much anywhere and <laughs> everywhere yeah. I can get the yeah. opportunity to okay awesome now the next question I already know the answer but I'm still going to ask you uh, which is your favorite destination and why um yeah. I'm assuming it's South Africa yeah of course <laughs> uh it's going to be South Africa yeah. and it's, it's going to be for the animals for all the right reasons exactly for all the animals. Yeah. but because you know we knew this answer uh which comes a close second um, Namibia, definitely, but mm. I also feel that's really close to South Africa. So um, I really enjoyed Vietnam, actually. Okay. Um, and yeah. that was a, a very cool place to visit. I think these types of countries are still, I don't want to say untouched because, yeah. of course, they have a lot of tourism. Yeah. yeah. Um, but they still have the natural beauty and it's not too commercial. And I love that. Okay, awesome. But uh, has there been any place that you have regretted going to or any incident that has happened in all your travel uh, life that has kind of not left a good taste in your mouth? I did go to Morocco this year. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of haters. I've got so many Moroccan friends here. Um, I would and say that's probably my least favorite place, but I think really? it's because I didn't go with someone that knew. So what happened really? I mean, I got a list of recommendations yeah. from a lot of people, but I don't know, maybe I was on like annual leave mode and just not concentrating. So we ended up um, spending a lot of time just traveling around. I actually took my parents there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm fed up of going back to rainy England and seeing them. So I try yeah. and meet them somewhere. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was very much looking forward to Moroccan couscous and I only actually found it in one place. Oh, my God. Um, so I just kept going back there because it's like one of my favorite things to eat. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there was nothing significant that w was bad. And mm. I, I love the people and especially they, they treat their, their cats and dogs very well, which mm. is something that, that stayed with me. But I think in terms of all of the places that I visited, that's probably the most stressful and the most time spent trying to figure out where we can go and how we can get Moroccan couscous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> priorities. <laughs> priorities. Yeah. You have to set your priorities right. But maybe when you go back the next time, you will do your research properly and, properly and listen to what people advise you. So yeah. it's not a place that you probably won't go back to, but it's not bringing you happy memories. Right? Yeah. And also it was it's quite similar to the UAE in a certain way in terms of the desert mm. and 
camels and all stuff, which I love. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't so much of a break from from the life I'm sure. used to, which yeah. is what I, I normally, it's like an escapism when I travel. So. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, we you just said that Namibia is kind of a hidden gem and you went there recently. But what is your hidden gem, which you have, you know, discovered in the past? Apart from Namibia, do you have a hidden gem that you have? Yeah, I mean, I think that's quite a, a tricky one. Um, there are so oh, would many. You stick to Namibia. Yeah, I mean, I can go back to to Namibia because I did do kind of a homestay there. So there's a, a family there that they're Namibian and they rescue orphans animals. Oh. So they've got a baboon called Cindy, and then they've got it's right up your alley. Yeah, exactly. Three meerkats, a mongoose. Yeah. I was in my element, and mm. it, it's just so nice because you get to see. Um, more of I would say the the rural side the cultural side rather than the commercial side of the mm-hmm. country and even on their farm they've got bushman paintings which have been painted oh, in blood or yeah. engravings um, and so much of this stuff that's I think undiscovered mm-hmm. and that's what I really like about it you've got the wildlife but then you've also got all of these as I call them hidden gems um, so you would say Namibia in general there is so much that they have to offer yeah yeah definitely so yeah. when you travel around say I mean South Africa the food is divine there but when you travel around I know you're looking forward to you know seeing and visiting and meeting on all the uh, animals but do you also look forward to food Oh, definitely. You do? I'm such a foodie. Oh, that's fantastic. (laughs) Because my next question is, if you had to travel around or if you could travel around the world in a day, where would you have your breakfast? Where would you have lunch? And then where would you have dinner? So I think for breakfast, I would go to France, Mm -hmm. uh, especially South France in the summer. Beautiful and the best pastries and all of the unhealthy stuff you can eat. Mm -hmm. Um, Then I think... Provence and Nice. Yeah, exactly. Nice or Marseille. Um, I think for lunch, I would probably go to Italy mm. or Japan. Okay. Because I love sushi, but I also love pasta and pizza. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all the unhealthy stuff I like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then for dinner, um, I think I would go to South Africa. They have very yeah. good meat. Yeah. It's lived a good life. But yeah. You can tell by the yeah. taste. I probably shouldn't say that if yeah. I'm no. animal protector. But um, yeah, the, the game meat, we we had oryx and um, different but kinds of meat. It was brilliant. You're not eating endangered species. It's like, you know, um, you're eating what is... I mean, they would not even... You're not eating something which is not allowed. So yeah. that's okay. And it is also how the circle of life is, right? Yeah, so, it's part of the process. I yeah. mean, quite often as well, there, there's almost too many animals that means other animals can't survive Mm. so they do a process called culling um the same in a lot of countries they do it for for pest species as well Mm. I couldn't actively be involved in it I don't think Mm. um but I do think there is a as you say a place for for the cycle of of life and I would rather them have lived an amazing life with a quick ending and then it be enjoyed rather than battery farming or or something like that and I've seen in South Africa I mean that they have a good life and so dinner in South Africa for yeah sure. I think yeah, so and yeah. sundowners we always have a, a nice course, uh, braai yeah. and, and drinks watching the sunset which is beautiful yeah so. somewhere near Camps Bay or something yeah, yeah exactly which is yeah. beautiful yeah oh that's fantastic so what about in Dubai you know there are so many places um, that we have in the offing like you can have a great South African meal here and you can have a great Japanese and Italian meal. But if you had to choose places to have breakfast, lunch and dinner here in Dubai, where do you think you would go? I always say to everyone that Dubai has the best food. True. Uh, Yeah, wherever I go, I I miss it. I think for breakfast, I would go to the Burj Al Arab only Mm. for the fact that it means I probably would have spent the night there. (laughs) And uh, definitely it's on my my bucket list to to spend a night at the Burj Al Arab. It's an experience. Exactly, Yeah. yeah. I think for lunch, I would probably get some traditional Emirati food, mm-hmm. uh, maybe on the beach or in the Northern Emirates. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think for dinner, I would go to, there's a restaurant called Goldfish. It's a Japanese restaurant. And uh, it not was- very well known though. No, yeah. it is not. And um, I think it's more well known now. I think they were nominated for a Michelin star. Mm-hmm. Um, but honestly, it's just the best food, like oh, very wow. good ingredients. Yeah, That's where I'd amazing. go for dinner. Okay. So should definitely check out yes, goldfish definitely but let's talk about experiences because you know i'm assuming you're the type who wants to be outdoors and you love animals so 
What is that one experience, that one unique experience here in Dubai that you highly recommend people should do? So I think people should come for at least a week when they visit Dubai. There's obviously all of the mainstream stuff that you see, the mm -hmm. Burj Khalifa, the Burj Al Arab, the yeah. city. Yeah. But for me, I think it's outside of the city, which is so beautiful. Um, going to Hatta or going to Jebel Hafid or Jebel Jais, so in the mm. Northern Emirates or in Abu Dhabi and visiting the, the scenery, the wildlife, the desert. And yeah. I think a lot of people, they just see Dubai as these tall skyscrapers, but it has yeah. so much more to offer. Yeah. It's such a beautiful country. And so you would city. recommend going outdoors, doing so many other things that uh, the UAE has to offer. And which is the one experience you think is like very enriching for you or something that you really enjoy? For me, I love hiking. So waking up early on a Saturday morning with my friends and just going and exploring. Mm -hmm. um, so we do that in Fajara, Ras Al Khaimah, et cetera. So I think that would be where I would And there are recommend. many groups that do that nowadays in, in Dubai. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about Wild Track now, you know. Uh, tell us how people can go about this whole trip with you if they want to come yeah in. so they can follow me on conservation clo or wild tracks on instagram and um there i've got all of the links for our trips for 2024 so they're all very differently priced because you go on different number of days for all these trips yeah and mainly it's the work that's being done so the majority of the cost is directly towards the operation mm -hmm. i just want to tell us a little more about why do you think these trips are important because there's something very serious in the midst of all of this yes yeah. it is a trip uh, but you know these animals are almost you know they're, they're facing extinction yeah right so just tell us a little bit about why do you think I mean there's so much you're contributing by going on that one trip. So I think people need to know about this. So let's talk about that. Yeah, there's the direct impact you're having, which is you're actually sponsoring the operation. And as I said, for a dehorning, as an example, if you take away the horn, you take away the reward. So that mm. rhino has been protected for at least another 12 months. Mm. Um, you then also have the indirect impact, which is you have people from all walks of life coming on these trips. And to give them the awareness that's needed and the education for why we're doing this. And I think connecting the right people for the right cause is something that's so impactful yeah. and is, is underestimated. Yeah. And that's another reason why we want to bring people together. Mm. And I think once you see something with your own eyes, yeah. the passion that you have is way bigger than just seeing a post on Instagram. And I think it's really amazing what you do. Thank you. So tell us now what is next in travel for you? What's on your bucket list? Um, Namibia, again, I'm going to go the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And then I've got seven trips, as I mentioned, to South Africa to throughout South Africa. the year. Okay. Um, but I do really want to go to Costa Rica. That's Ooh. also on my list. Okay. Um, I feel like, you know, the volcanoes, the jungle and, and all of that's really exciting. Yeah, and inviting. And, yeah, and also yeah. Bali. That's on my list as well. Mm -hmm. Um so I need to try and fit them in between yeah. all my annual leave and public holidays. Sure, somehow. I'm sure you will. And <laughs> yeah. I hope you do. Uh, and I hope you find newer countries um, which need attention, which need the support um, from you and the kind of work that you do. It's incredible. And I really wish you all the best. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, Really looking forward to all the work that you're doing uh, and will be doing in the future. And I really hope more and more people come uh, with you on these journeys because these animals really need the support, you know, and um, we don't want them to get extinct. We want the future generations to be able to see that, you know, animals like these exist. So thank you so much for doing what you do and thank you for coming on the podcast today. Thanks so much for having me and thanks for spreading the message and the awareness. It's Anytime. really appreciated. Always, always. The support from this podcast will always be there thank with you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for tuning in today. I hope our conversations have fueled your wanderlust and inspired you to explore the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and let us know what you thought of today's episode. Until the next time, safe travels and keep exploring.